sometimes people think this meditation that we just did, in, out, deep, slow, calm, ease, smile, release, present moment, wonderful moment. We also have a song. <coughs> Maybe that's the reason why people think that, you know, sometimes people think, oh, it's so simple, it's so easy. It's like a child, you know, like kindergarten. I think partially because we have a song, so naturally we, <laughs> we think of it as a kindergarten. And yes, it's true. It's, it is really very simple. And at the same time, this is all there is. You know, we can talk about a lot of Buddhist thought and Buddhist psychology, but at the end of the day, it's going to come down to, can I smile and release? Can I release all my ideas? Can I smile to life? Can I connect with life? And can this moment be a wonderful moment. Now, it's kind of an interesting question because, you know, we all know that some moments are nicer, some moments we enjoy, and some moments are actually quite difficult. So the trick is going to be how do we make every moment a wonderful moment? And then the definition of wonderful is going to be kind of interesting. It's not gonna. It's not gonna be the same um, definition as a, as an ice cream moment. You know, this is not chocolate ice cream with whipped cream moment. Because you know, if that's what we're looking for, not every moment can be like that. It's just not possible. There's only so much ice cream you can eat. There's no capacity <laughs> for it, even if the food was available. So. It's really a question of how do we how do we learn to make every moment a wonderful moment? And the answer really lies in letting go of our ideas. How can we let go of what we you know if we think that I have to have chocolate ice cream with whipped cream? Or no, not chocolate ice cream, but it must be butter pecan, whatever, you know, pistachio, then we're in trouble because we will get only so much of that happening. And then what about the rest of the world? So um, the whole um, Buddhist path is to train the mind to be able to be spacious and to really see every moment as a wonderful moment, in spite of possibly huge amounts of suffering that we do have at that very moment as well. It's not denying it, but just being able to embrace the things and being able to find happiness. It's very important that we can find happiness. You know, um, there can be peace around us, there can be happiness, and yet um, there can be I you can't hear? She can't hear very well. So oh, it's just not going to change the yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's important that people should be able to hear. Otherwise, it's. I think this is the other close. How's that? Okay. You, you wave if you don't. Have. Thank you. Um, so it's really all about training our mind happy. We think that happiness is a natural thing, and it should be. And yet if we look at it, we, s we tend to find that many of us, it's very natural for us to, to complain. It's very natural for us to find what's wrong. And it doesn't seem to be quite so natural um, to be happy. It's kind of odd, but that's just the human condition. You know, there's just something in us that sort of resists. Wants to, wants to find what's wrong. And there's plenty of things to, to be wrong, you know, that are wrong. So we're being reinforced by that, you know. Yeah, the world is kind of falling apart, and, you know, there's the elections, and there's the economy, and that there's always something that's wrong. It always will be. So the Buddha defined it. When the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree, the story is that throughout the three watches of the night, 
the end, the way of expressing time. First, he, rec he recognized um, causes and conditions within him. And then by the third, one, then he recognized that everything is made of causes and conditions. Nothing is, uh, nothing exists on its own. And then he, in the third watch, he was able to see through the causes and conditions of everything out there. In other words, it's kind of like saying I can account for every molecule or every atom, something like that. So here's a guy who's having this incredible understanding, and he can, so he can see how come you are like you are because, oh, you have these kinds of parents and this kind of culture, you were born into this century, and this is the kind of schooling, and these are the kinds of expectations, and all these things contribute to who you are. And you can see that for every, every leaf of every tree. And what does he do? He goes out and gives the first Dharma talk, which is called the turning of the Dharma wheel, and then he says, pronounces what, what are called the four noble truths. There is suffering. There's a cause for suffering. There's a way out of suffering. There's an end to suffering. There's a way out of suffering. And here's the path. Here's the way, which is called the Eightfold Path. So he describes the path out of suffering. So it's a little bit interesting. You know, here is a guy who knows where every molecule has come from and can draw every electron sort of thing in the universe. And what does he have to say? First noble truth, there is suffering. There's dissatisfaction in life. It just is. That's a truth. And what's interesting is we call it a holy truth or a noble truth. Okay? So he, he didn't just say, you, you know, I mean, he did say there is suffering. That is actually what he says. But the, the, the way we interpret it, the way we call it, we call it a noble truth or a holy truth. So we have to ask ourselves, what's so holy and what's suffering? You know, we all think, oh, suffering. We don't know that. But actually, as it turns out, suffering is the stuff that makes us awake. Because if everything goes fine, you know, it's like you're just running along, then you, then you have no reason to change to to wake up to and the word Buddha means to be awakened. Buddha comes from to wake up. So the Buddha is the one who is awake. So first of all to be awake to my suffering. And then we have to ask where is, where is the suffering? So suffering is really important at all. Not just because it makes us suffer, but also because it has the potential to wake us up. And that's the really a wonderful thing. So that's when when I am suffering, if I can keep that in mind, you know, it's, it's that thing that people we often say, oh, use it as a lesson. It's a teacher. Those people who are pissing you off, they're really very good teachers for you. But there's something that's very useful. You know, sometimes it's, oh, please. But, but it's true. You know, it doesn't mean you have to love these people. It would be nice if you could. But at the same time, to recognize, oh, it's showing me something. It's showing me how my mind latching onto something. It's showing me that my mind is, why is my mind not happy? To be able to ask it, rather than to judge it. My tendency is to judge. I think that most of us have a tendency like that. You know, we want to evaluate. We were taught in school, you know, evaluate, figure it out, and if it's not good, get rid of it. Kind of thing. So, how can I just look I have a pattern here in my mind that makes me suffer. And maybe over time, the pattern will, that pattern will start dissolving, not be so strong. But I have to come to it with, from where I am, rather than often we say, oh, I have this pattern. But, but really, I'm not like this. We often come towards our problems in that manner. We want to be somewhere else instead of being where we are. So one of the tricks about the whole practice is to be Come to the practice as we are, and to be okay with where we are. Our so-called shortcomings. You know, we're not a Buddha. 
not a single one of us is named Buddha, as far as I know. They have an interesting name, but <laughs> I believe you have other names. Um, so chances are that we have our moments of suffering and moments of more enlightened situations. And how can we embrace both moments without judgment? That's coming to the practice as I am rather than, oh, but I should know better. I should know not to react to this. This is an attitude that doesn't work. You know, we, we all know this attitude. We know we've been told many times, whether you know, already when you were in kindergarten, don't play nicely with these kids and don't annoy them and don't do this. Right? You probably had you some version of that in your childhood, being told what's an appropriate behavior. And you would find yourself time and time again, you're in the sandbox and Oh, you're not supposed to do this because mommy told you if you do this, he will do that to you. And then I'll be upset at you. Whatever it is that you were told, you were told some story how you are not good if you were about to do what you're about to do. And it's not just as a child, as an adult, we do this also. And what do you know? <laughs> there you went and you did it. <laughs> and you caused all this turmoil and suffering in yourself and other people. And the teacher didn't like you that you should not do it again and you said, oh no, I will not do it again. And three days later, of course, you did it again because that's just the nature of who we are. And usually these things are not terrible. You know, most of us are not mass murderers, thankfully. So it's not, the consequences are really more to ourselves. So it's just, it doesn't help to say to ourselves, don't do it. Don't eat the ice cream, you will, you will get a headache or you will get a tummy ache. Most of us know that you know the ice cream is there or whatever your equivalent of ice cream is. And you just have it because well, that's kind of cool. You don't have to force it to say, oh, but there will be a headache or there will be a tummy ache. So when we look at our suffering, we have to look at the Buddha said everything nourished by some food. So we have to look at what are the causes of our suffering. Where does it come from? Now the Buddha described it this way. He said the suffering comes from ignorance, primarily <coughs> ignorance. So this makes sense because, you know, I eat the ice cream and I'm ignorant of the fact that there will be a headache. So we, we tend to chase pleasure. But we are ignorant of the fact that this pleasure is not very long lasting. Then there's other ignorances, you know, that are more serious, I suppose. And because we are attached to things, and we have aversion to things. So we want what's, what's pleasurable, we want to push away what's unpleasurable. We have an idea of what's pleasurable, what's not pleasurable. So we're in this constant game of pleasure seeking, of attaching ourselves to things, being attached to things. And yet, you know, whatever you're attached to, everything is impermanent. Everything has a lot, you know, like only lasts a certain amount of time. Whether it's the bowl of ice cream, or whether it's your, um, your pet, or whether it's your child, or your mother, or everything that you love, at some point will disintegrate. That's just the nature of life, because we keep changing. And Sometimes those that we love, suddenly they change and they become those that we don't love. They changed, or we change. Our relationship has changed. Things change. And then we suffer because things change. So that's, if we're acting ignorantly, in other words, we're acting as if things are permanent and they're always going to be like this, therefore I'm attached. I love this and I hold on to it and then one day it go, it's gone. But if I go, oh, this is very sweet, this is very nice, I like the sound of this bell, and one day I'll lose the bell, or whatever, that's okay. So how can I have no attachment? So in early Buddhist thought, um, non-attachment, letting go of attachments, of desires, of anger, um, of ignorance, was really the, what was really the key for liberation. <coughs> 
And later on, as we talked a little bit before, before we started, um, a few centuries later, people looked at, well, how can we, if, if we emphasize the, the ability to have wisdom about things, a better vision about things, we may have to worry a little bit less about all that. We won't devote the attachments to human because we'll, we'll have a larger view. That's the hope. It's not always the, the way it works necessarily. But, you know, so that, that's a slightly different door. So our cravings, our attachments and aversions, and our fixating on things is what the Buddha says is the, pretty much the cause of our suffering. We're trying to attach ourselves to things that are ultimately changing constantly. So we, we suffer when they change. Or we try and avoid things, and then again we think they're permanent, so oh, I'm going to avoid this thing I don't like. Well, the thing you don't like change also. And if I hang out with this long enough, I may actually change my attitude towards it. I may not have such a strong aversion. So this play between attraction and aversion, and we're playing the same constant, is one of the big causes of our suffering. But then, so when we're looking at the food, everything has food. If you deprive things of food, some things have to be deprived for a long time of food before they dissipate. Um, for example, bed bugs, I'm told, need about a year without oxygen before they go away. The reason I know is because I had an incident, <laughs> so I had to figure it out. Um, so it's kind of a long time without food. But everything requires food. A human being, as far as we know, most of us, we at least need air. Some people seem to live without food. I'm told our people are retharians. Um, but generally speaking, we, we say that most human beings require water, require food on a regular basis. So after a few days, if you get no food, you will perish, fade away. So the same thing, if, if I cut off the food of, for my suffering, if I don't feed my suffering, hopefully it goes away. <coughs> That's the logic. So one of the things that feeds my suffering, how, what causes my suffering? So we, if we look and we look at, I really hate this, whatever this is, I hate this. Let's say it's a person, it's a situation, whatever it is, it's my bank account, it's my car, or lack of either. I hate this. I'm angry at it. You take another person and you ask, what do you think of this? They say, oh, it's very cool. I like it. I just don't know. Your bank account to you, living in this country, may seem very small. The same bank account to someone in a different country or a refugee it may seem like, wow, this is Donald Trump. <laughs> you know? it's, it varies according to our perceptions. So we all know the situation where there's a person in a group and you just do not get along with this person. It happens. And someone else loves this person. And then sometimes because the other that person who loves the person that you don't like, you start not liking them because they like the wrong person in your idea. But that's kind of thinking a bit further. But the point is, how can they love that person and you kind of think, oh God, everything they do is, you know, they're not intelligent, they're not this, they're not this, that, you know, we have all that. Routine. It's our perceptions. It can't be that person. Because some people love this person. <coughs> And some people think, oh my god, this person's like a total yogi. <clears throat> I mean, I think one of my examples right now, I mean, let's talk about the practice. You know, we have to be with what we have. I would love to say that I don't have judgments, but I do. And you may not appreciate my particular judgments, but um, someone like Donald Trump, he's not my favorite person. <clears throat> it's kind of like just the, the way it is. You don't have to agree with my politics, no. But I also have to acknowledge that there are people who are 
literally in the food of Donald Trump. What's going on here? It has to do with me. It has to, I can say lots of people also dislike him, granted. But that's not an objective reality. That's my view of Donald Trump. This is my, what I've labeled Donald Trump as. <coughs> now, it's a lot easier. I don't have to, you know, it's like I don't have to live with Donald Trump 24-7. Sometimes with the media, it sounds like we do have to do it, but at <coughs> some point, he's really not, you know, it, it's not so close and intimate. And I can choose to make it a big subject for myself and suffer tremendously. Or I can choose to relax about it. So <coughs> our suffering really comes from our perceptions. How we, we, we choose how we see. We may not choose consciously, but it's how do we perceive. So if I can change my perceptions, or if I'm willing not to buy into every perception, if I can say, my perception of Donald Trump is, and I won't describe, because that would be a little bit rude to describe my perceptions, I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> but I have not transformed my um, feelings about Donald Trump very well yet. <laughs> Maybe one day. But, um, so if I have these feelings about Donald Trump and I can say, okay, these are just my perceptions. The reality of Donald Trump may be different. It may be. Can I accept it? Can I accept the fact that this is what I think and it's just my thinking? Bernie Glassman likes to, has a wonderful expression, he says, it's just your opinion. It's just my opinion that this is not a good enough bank account. It's just an opinion. Now I'm going to go and justify this opinion, and I'm going to go and do the math and show you how this bank account is just not enough to pay for this and this and this and this and this and this. And this. I can totally justify why this bank account is not large enough. And someone else can totally do the math and tell you how this bank account it's just fabulous. No, not you know, it's a judgment call. It depends on your perspective. It depends on how you perceive it. So we, the thing is to recognize that all our suffering comes from how we perceive things. So the classical example, and not just in Buddhist thinking, this is like classically Indian of the time, is you see a rope on the road, and you perceive it as a snake. And they, they do this actually in modern psychology too. They show people pictures of something coiled. And if they play nice music before, the person says, oh, this is a rope. And if they play scary music before, people say, oh, it's a snake. So it's, it's um, apparently the Buddha became, you know, came before um, Freud or something, you know. Like, so they, they, they actually are using the exact same. They have a few other pictures of the same nature. You know, there are pictures where you can see a squirrel or you can see an alligator, depending on your mood. So it shows us that our perceptions are actually wrong. They are really dependent on what we come to it with. There's no objective reality. Is it a crocodile? Is it a rope? Is it a snake? Is it a snake? It's all going to depend on what we bring in. I bring in many, many things. I bring in my culture, I bring in my perceptions of many other things, I bring in my belief systems. I, believe in my, I bring in my mood. I bring in many things that at that moment, and if I heard a certain kind of music three seconds beforehand, will influence me as to say whether this is a squirrel or an alligator. Should I be scared of it? Or should I say, oh, this is a cute. It's, it's not so dependent on the reality as much as it's dependent on how I see the world. So one of the big things that the Buddha suggested is that most of our perceptions, the way he, the Buddha phrased it, it was, where there is perception, there is misperception. Which basically implies that most of our perceptions are misperceptions. There's no one way to perceive. 
many ways to perceive it, and to be open to that. So we often suffer because we perceive something a certain way, and then we can't get out of that perception. Now, people will argue, yes, that's very true when, um, you know, when I have um, psychological pain. But what about actual physical pain? You know, you know there really is a crocodile. So again, um, I think we, we, make ex we latch on, we make excuses. Because th this, is, this is the consciousness we're used to. So we're, we're going to say, how it's, I, I don't quite see how it's possible. If you cut my arm, I'm going to feel pain. I'm going to say, yes, that's absolutely true. I have not cut my arm. But I've, you know, I've, well, I've cut places in my arm every so often. And, you know, yes, it hurts. And, that's just the reaction of the nervous system. <coughs> now does my whole being have to suffer? And that, strangely enough, can I extend that idea? Does my whole being have to suffer even when I'm facing death? It's a very interesting question. Most of us will go, that's kind of beyond us. So we're, we train ourselves in creating space around the smaller problems so that when a big problem arises, we may have better tools to be able to face it without fear, without angst, without my whole being locking down into fear, into angst, into anger, into sadness. It doesn't mean we don't get angry. It doesn't mean that we don't have fear. <clears throat> but we can contain it, or we can slowly dissipate do it at the base, we do it constantly and transform the way we see in general, we will hopefully one day be able to face things like life-threatening situations and not get abandoned. Dick Nathan likes to talk about if you're in an airplane and uh, the airplane is diving, there's some danger. If we all get panicked, you know, it's like the airplane's just going no one's going to fly the plane. So the person who can keep calm is very important. Being able to keep a spacious calmness in the face of adversity is very important. I mean, you know, when we think of all the problems we're making about our bank accounts, and this one didn't like me, and they said something rude to me, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then we're looking at like, and what happens when the alligator comes and wants to eat you? Like, you know, proportions of suffering. So, how can we make, yes, acknowledge that there is suffering, on the one hand, there really is a lot of suffering, and in ourselves, not just in the world, we are part of the world. If there's suffering in the world, there's suffering in us, it can't be suffering. And at the same time, how can we say, this is a wonderful moment, and really mean that? How is that possible? And we know that people have done it, so it gives us hope. We know that there have been people in gulags and concentration camps who have been able to connect with things like a sunset and see beauty in spite of the incredible conditions that they have. So how can we connect to life in a deep way? That's what we practice. That's what meditation is. That's what this whole um, phenomenon that we call mindfulness nowadays. Well, not nowadays, we've always called it mindfulness, but it's become popular. That's what it's all about. To train the mind to be more open, not constrict, not to latch onto perception and hold it. How can I smile to life with all its wonders? and also all its misery, and release, release my ideas. My idea is that life should be like this. And we have so many of these ideas of what will make me happy, what will make the world happy. And how can we release that and just live life to connect with what actually is out there and in here, rather than our ideas of what isn't. So we live mostly 
in the world of our ideas. And that's what creates suffering. Because when we connect to what actually is, there's a lot less suffering. You know? Yes, you know, Donald Trump may still win the election. Yes, there are wars in the world. Yes, the economy is not doing very well. And yes, my bank account, like any bank account out there in the world, can disappear. It doesn't seem very reasonable to us, but it's actually true. The value of any currency can really disintegrate in any moment, depending on the social consciousness that happens. Anyone who looks at history, at history of wars, sees that. Yes, there are people in wars that make money, but the vast majority of people lose that. Every single one of us, we live in the United States, but we can become a refugee if the right conditions came about. We're not trained to believe it's possible. We as Americans, are one of the strong perception that we have is that we're very strong and we're very safe. We may not like some of the things that we have, we may feel less safe about certain things, but we certainly don't think of ourselves as taking a boat on a rough sea, or sending our children on the sea, to a sea, to be refugees. But it really can happen to us. We don't know what set of causes and conditions it will take to make it. But if it can happen in Syria, if it can happen in Vietnam, if it can happen in Cambodia, if it can happen in any other country, If Germans in the 30s, we might say they all went mad, and something happened in the culture that was the most, still considered probably the highest culture, in, you know, most educated, financially stable, etc., etc. At the time, it wasn't financially stable, right? That's one cause of it. But if Germans can turn and kill people, create killing machines, by the millions. Then this is not something that, oh, only some small country in Africa can do it, and you can tell people in Africa that, oh, these people are you know, cockroaches, that they, they will kill them. No, because you can do that with any, any culture, supposedly high cultures, which means that it can happen to us. There's no guarantee. And then if it does happen to us, how do you know which side you will be on? How do you know that you will not be on the refugee side? You just don't know. You really don't know what tomorrow will bring. So it's kind of interesting. I'm encouraging you to think of like there is no, <laughs> there's no safety net. And yet, how can I be happy? Because as long as I'm latching onto a safety net, in some ways I can't fully be happy. I think I'm happy because, well, I have my safety net my safety to do And that's why the Buddha encouraged, you know, he, he did create a monastic order and encouraged people to leave home, to leave the safety, and at that time to beg for food every day, to go and beg for food. So you didn't have anything, and you were supposed to have a robe and a, and a bowl, and you would go around and ask for food. So that you can see that you're dependent on everyone else. You're dependent on others to give you food. And there is no guarantee for what will happen in three minutes, but there is this moment right there. There's this moment. And can I be spacious at this moment? This is kind of what the Buddha encouraged his followers to live in this moment and let go of worries, and let go of all our attachments and our aversions. In one form, so many of our attachments are about our physical home, our physical bank accounts, or, you know, all our material goods, and the people that we love. It doesn't mean we won't wish them harm or we want to get rid of them. It just means whatever is challenging as followers, can you leave them? still, you know, can you 
find happiness without attachments. Because our tendency is to be attached to physical, um, material goods and people. So can you, can you let go? It's a question. There's no, again, we have to come to the practice as we are, not as we think we should be, or as someone thinks the Buddha thought you should be. You know, it's just speculation. I wasn't, I wasn't around with the Buddha. I don't know what the Buddha really told these people. But I'm guessing, that sounds like, you know, he was encouraging them, let go of everything. He wasn't saying become an ascetic. We know that. Okay, because the Buddha said there has to be a middle way. Not asceticism, but let go. So, and if my answer is, no, I can't let go, that's totally fine. So I recognize it's not so easy for me to let go. I was, I'm very indoctrinated in a certain culture, and I'm very <coughs> attached to certain people or beings that I love. And it's not so easy for me to let go. And then I work with that. And, you know, I can still love, and I train myself to let go and still love. I train myself to enjoy the fact that I have certain material advantages, but not be attached. So it's a training. It's not a one thing. It's not like we cut off everything. Now some people are able to do that. It's a little too far into <laughs> encouraging letting go altogether. But just recognizing, you know, at, at least that um, so much of our suffering is, is more about not willing to let go. And so when we sit and we meditate, and of course not every time you sit and meditate you feel, wow, everything is cool. But every so often you get that sense of like, wow, everything is just fine. You know, I don't, I'm not worried, the bank account doesn't exist right this second. The bank account still exists in the bank account, but I don't have to worry about it right this second. Or this person that's really bothering me, they're really rude to me, and they're going to keep being rude, you know, like I'm going to keep perceiving them as being rude to me, and I'm angry at them, etc. They're still there, but at this moment, I'm okay with it. Creating that space in the mind, when we meditate, we stop the habitual mind. The habitual mind likes to latch on and say, okay, let's go and just keep Telling me this, telling myself the story about how this person hates me, and they were so rude, and they don't know anything. And they, you know, you all know how this goes. You know, it's usually if if you're intelligent and really good at it, you basically have three sentences that you're repeating. And if you're less intelligent, like I am, you have like half a sentence and you're just repeating in your mind again and again. You don't even have a variety in, in your anger. It's just like. They're pissing me off, they're pissing me off, they're pissing me off. <laughs> and then you start going, well, why are they pissing me off? And you don't even remember often. What, what, what is it? What happened there? You know, and interesting enough, we can justify why, and they're so horrible, and, and, but, but, what, but what really happened? Because when I really ask myself what really happened, I'm going to come back to it. It's nothing to do with them, it has to do with me. Because how come someone else saw the exact same incident or was targeted in the same way that I supposedly was and they're not so obsessing? It's my obsession. It's my anger, not the other person. The other person just triggered something. They did something. They triggered something inside. So much of our suffering comes from the mind gets occupied, like there's a switch that we turn on, and now we're like in some loop, and we start to suffer. So could we turn that switch off? Can we release the mind from this whatever neurotic loop, or you know, those neurons, and bring in other neurons? Can we do that? That's what we train ourselves in meditation, to open, to become spacious, to connect to everything there is, to connect to life fully, rather than to connect with this thought. 
Now, of course, it's much harder if there's a lot of pain in your arm. Your arm is being cut off, and there's a lot of pain. The mind is going to want to come. It's going to get occupied here. And if we are good meditators, and we constantly train our mind, when my arm is cut off, it's my hope. I don't have personal experience. That I can open up to more than just zoom into this. The Buddha talked about it in, as a metaphor of um, a second arrow. And um, he said that he talked about the consciousness. That the consciousness is food for suffering. Uh, my own consciousness is the food, one of the foods of my suffering. So if you shoot someone, if you shoot an arrow into someone, it hurts. If you then keep shooting them, if you just take the arrow out, it will hurt and it will heal. But then if you shoot another arrow into the exact same spot and then another arrow, another arrow, it will hurt a million times more. The first injury hurts, but the second arrow hurts you. The third arrow, you know, it just escalates it. And that's what we do, strangely. We get hurt by something. Someone said something unkind. We heard bad news. You know, whatever it is, we got angry at something. And then we rehearse it. The mind sort of closes around that news. So now we're in the loop. We got a second arrow. Instead of taking the arrow out and healing, we churn ourselves around it. So we have to learn to open up. And yes, there is an arrow here, and I took it out and it's still hurt. But don't obsess on it. So the Buddha also suggested practice that he called, um, at the time he said, change the peg. It will be equivalent to changing the television station. You are stuck on a station, on a channel, that is all about my anger. It's all about my fear. It's all about my insecurity. It's all about my you know, lack of self-confidence. I'm not good enough. I didn't do this. I should have. You know, you know those stories. You know those channels. They appear on your TV guide constantly. Right? You have your own internal TV guide. And this, the trick is to say, OK, Self-loathing, lack of self-worth, anger, hatred, whatever it is that I'm obsessing on. I know this channel. Let me switch it. It's like, you know, you're saying, I've seen this, I've seen this episode of Law and Order like 50 million times. I think I can switch to something else, whatever it is that you want. There's a nice concert with someone else, you know, might be more fun. Yeah. Switch the channel. The problem is it's hard to switch. Because we, in some strange way, we enjoy this obsession. And we're tr the mind tr is, is well trained into narrowing itself down. So what we're doing in meditation is we're opening, we're creating more space in the mind. We're training the mind to be spacious. More importantly, we're training the mind to connect. To connect with what's real. Not with the stories we tell ourselves. I'm telling myself a story that I'm very angry and this person did a terrible thing to me. Okay. When did it happen? 35 years ago. Sometimes it was only 35 minutes ago, but it's still, it's a long distance. It's, it's already a distance away. Yeah. What's happening right now? What's available to me right now? Is the question that will help me let go of what happened 35x ago. Okay. So yeah, somebody cuts you off on the road, and you go, oh god. <laughs> somebody slaps you, you go, oh damn. Now, there's different levels, but when it happens, yeah, there will be a little bit of a reaction. No big deal. I think to ask ourselves to have absolutely no reaction constantly, it's a very tall order. But what we can ask of ourselves is to look at the fact that we're rehearsing it constantly. 
and to try and train ourselves in letting it go. Whatever it is, our worries, our anxieties, our fears. So, and then maybe if we get good at it, then maybe we find ourselves reacting less and less, and sometimes we, we won't react, and maybe sometimes we still will. I've seen some very wonderful teachers, very um, great beings. They still get angry. It's a human phenomenon. We all have anger in us. It's okay. We don't have to become not angry. Be nice, but it's not. It's, um, it's not a prerequisite for a happy one. The prerequisite is to be able to recognize my anger, embrace it, and become bigger. So the Buddha talked about it like, if you put a little bit of salt in a glass of water, the water tastes very salty. But if I take the same amount of salt, say half a teaspoon, and put it in a river, you don't taste the salt. How can I make my mind larger than any one thing? So we tend to make our minds smaller, and the practice is to make our mind larger. So how do we do that? So the first thing we do is we, we stop. We don't stop the mind. People talk about meditation as, to meditate is to stop thinking, stop the mind. That's not correct. I, I can't argue with that. I don't know what they do in meditation. It's very hard for us to know whatever. But um, I think to stop the mind isn't, uh, it's not really fully possible. Some people are very good at various capacities of the mind, and therefore they can stop, say, sensory input. They can do different things. Most of us are not at that level. What we can do is we can stop the habitual mind, the monkey mind, the mind that runs and grabs at things constantly, and keeps switching for things that it wants to grab, but it's always grabbing. That I can stop. So the first step in meditation is we call shamatha, which is stopping, calming, stopping. To calm the mind, to stop the mind. It doesn't mean become blank. It means stop the running, stop the anxiety, stop that habitual pattern that we have, and calm it. So interestingly enough, the Chinese translated this term to jiu, to stop stop the habitual mind. The Tibetans translated it into shine, which means calm abiding. So each took a one, one aspect, but both of them have to happen. You cannot have calm abiding of the mind unless you stop its habits. And the moment you stop the habits, the mind will naturally be calm. So there are two aspects of the same thing, but for most of us, we have to recognize can we do both? Can we, we are attempting it. Stopping the habitual mind in order to calm it. Calm the habitual mind in order to stop the habits. There are kind of two, two aspects of the same. So we're trying to calm the mind. So that we get out of those loops, out of the patterns, out of the pattern of the narrowing. So we become larger. And we want to connect with what's beautiful, what's wonderful. What's, do we want to want to plant the village we call nourishing, seeds of nourishment. What's nourishing about life? What's wonderful about life? Yes, I have a bank account of a certain size. I have a car or that's not working. I have a whatever, you know, a person that's pissing me off. I have all sorts of things. And at the same time, there's also wonderful things. Can I open up to what's wonderful? It doesn't mean I become holy okay? you know, some, For some of us, that's kind of like, you know, we don't want to live in that, so everything is wonderful. No, we shouldn't. We actually should live in a world that has both suffering and beautiful suffering. And 
the sunset is actually one of the most incredible examples. It's there one moment and it's gone. You can't latch onto it. But can I enjoy it when it's there? So things like the blue sky, like the sunrise, like the sunset, clouds, forests, they're always there for us in a way. You can always go and touch them. So that's why touching nature is so important because it helps us heal. It helps us be able to stop and calm. So, often in meditation we use metaphors like that, connecting with it, with the blue sky, connecting with the ocean, connecting with mountains, connecting with flowers, so that we can build a different kind of habit in mind, a habit that's more spacious. a lot mentioned is something called um, the um, four or eight world dharmas. It's four pairs actually. Um, and they are that we have a tendency to seek pleasure and avoid pain. We're constantly, we, you know, there's nothing wrong with experiencing pleasure. But it, when we start spending so much of our energy seeking pleasure, avoiding we can't connect with anything except our notions of what's a pleasure and what's a pain. And often we're seeking pleasure that's not pleasurable. So we're trying to, can I train myself to not run away from pain constantly? And we're always seeking to gain something, to get something. So even, you know, we come here and we want to get something. I want to get that Buddhist psychology thing under my belt. We're always seeking to gain and not to lose. So, coming to terms with the fact that life is actually a game of no, nothing is gained and nothing is lost. Things just keep changing. You know, I'm at an age where um, sometimes I find myself going, oh, I said that, I really didn't mean that. <laughs> you know, some words come wrong. I no longer, my mind doesn't gain in the same way that it did when I was twenty. It's not as agile. I'm quote unquote losing part of my mind. So, and I think a lot of us will go through that at some stage. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not at a stage where I have Alzheimer's or anything, but it, I, I know that this is not the mind I used to have when I was twenty. I had a much more um, disciplined and, and fast mind. So I can sit here and be very sorry for this and really suffer tremendously because I am no longer the person I used to be. I lost something. But, um, you know, as most older people will say, well, I gained some experience. It, it, it's, the, you know, the loss and gain, someone else has the mind, the kind of mind I used to have when I was I don't. Someone else does. So this losing and gaining constantly, trying to make sure I gain, it's sort of, it's not going to work anyway. Because at the end, we're all going to lose, quote unquote. We can't latch on to things. So when we see things bigger and when we say, oh, okay, I may have lost it, but they have So, you know, if we looked at it like that with our bank accounts, it might make us a little happier. Oh. I just lost this three hundred dollars, you know, because oh, I had to repair this thing that really didn't need repair. And, you know, you know how we go. Oh, I could have gotten it cheaper. <laughs> kind of, you know, we, we suffer so much because I spent this money on fixing or paying something I didn't really. It turned out I didn't really. They sold me an insurance I didn't need. Whatever the case is, and we get all upset. And that if I could also say, well, the three hundred dollars I would have had in for this insurance that would have been in my account now is now in someone else's account. They're enjoying their they're enjoying three hundred dollar ice cream cones now. Whatever. 
can I enjoy in the joy of other people? So gain and loss is only in perspective to me. What I lost, someone else gained. And if someone else gained it, then what's the problem? If I don't latch on to myself, if I'm not attached to it, it has to be mine. So we spend a lot of our time trying to not lose. It's basically a waste of time. Then we spend a lot of time avoiding blame. We want to be praised. Everybody wants to be told they're good. Nobody wants to get the blame. So, it doesn't matter. It's just an opinion. They praised you, they blamed you, they this, they that. Yeah, it's much nicer when people praise you. I, I agree. I, I love to be praised too. It's not like I'm, I'm not saying that it's, there's, not, there's something <coughs> inherently wrong in praise. But there's something not useful in constantly running for praise and escaping the possibility of time praise. Can I just take it as it is? These are just questions. These are not expectations. And the last one of those, it sounds very similar to praise and blame, is we all want a good reputation. We want people to like us. And that's why it's so similar to praise and blame. And none of us want a bad reputation. Nobody walks around and says, blame me for everything. And, you know, make me the scapegoat. I, you know, everybody, you know. But the reality is when we look, you know, in 300 years, will it matter? Does it matter who was praised, who was blamed? What reputation? Can I be happy even when my reputation right now is seems tarnished. Can I be happy when I don't seem to be gaining something? Can I be happy when there's no pleasure? You know, there's no nice food, there's no, you know, attractive people massaging me or something, you know, whatever the pleasures are. There's no wonderful car, you know. Can I still be happy? And I think the answer really is that yes. We have phrase, we say, we train ourselves to understand that all the causes and conditions for my happiness are already here. How wonderful can life be when all my happiness is really available to me, instead of I'm fighting for my happiness constantly? Maybe the redefinition of happiness, instead of like grabbing the moment I grab at narrowing the mind, and when I'm recognizing that my happiness is truly dependent on only one thing, the relaxation and the opening of my mind, of me connecting with what actually is, instead of averting what I don't want, and latching onto what I do, narrowing the mind. That's why most of us, when we meditate, we calm the mind. And we get a little bit more space in both the body and the mind. We get happy. We don't get happy like when we are drunk happy, but we feel a certain kind of happiness. So happiness is all about can I let go and open up? <coughs> and it's, it's quite. It's an interesting trick because. It sounds so simple, and we resist it constantly because we're so used to grabbing. We're grabbing onto, we have so many ideas, we just grab and grab and grab. And ultimately, the practice is really about letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go. So in these eight worldly dharmas, really, we want to lose, we want to let go. Just let, it, just let it go so we can just be. You know? um, we get so caught up on Monday, we were here and um, we walked out and I said, oh, it's a full moon, let's just look at the moon. Can I just connect with the moon? Just enjoy the full moon. Enjoy half a moon. Enjoy rain. 
whatever it is that's being offered to us, can I just be there and enjoy it? <coughs> so that's the habit that as meditators we're trying to build, building up that bank account of I can just be with this. I can just have space. So it becomes a little bit more second nature. really connect with what it is rather than connect with what you know the tendency is to go back to the